So carbon mm-hmm. market has been in many headlines recently, and we have heard a lot this morning from our financial secretary and chief executive and also Dr. Ma. And recently, we have uh, seen the launch of the China national ETS market, one of the biggest in the world, and also seen a voluntary carbon trading platform being launched in our neighbor city. So without further delay, I'm very excited to have a pool of our carbon experts with us today. So I'm going to ask our um, panel speaker to introduce themselves. First of all, I will introduce the one online. So let's start with uh, Chris. So Chris is joining us from London. It is 2 a.m. So a special thanks for joining us, uh, Chris, on this. Can I ask you to introduce yourself and then we go to Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, hi, good afternoon or good morning. I'm not sure what time it is actually in Hong Kong, but uh, it's very early here anyway. Um, yes, my name is Chris Leeds. I work for Standard Chartered. I am the head of carbon markets development. And um, that role is um, uh, is a fairly new role. Uh, and I, I, my, my role is to uh, develop the carbon markets both internally and externally. Um, so we recently started trading the European Emissions Trading Scheme, which I'll talk a little bit um, about uh, shortly. Um, but we uh, we intend to trade the voluntary carbon markets in 2022, and uh, as they develop other other carbon markets around the world, and hopefully that includes the uh, China Emissions Trading Scheme. Um, I, I've been working very closely with our CEO Bill Winters uh, on the um, initiatives around the voluntary carbon market. Uh, Bill was the task force. Uh, sorry, Bill was the chairman of the uh, task force for scaling the voluntary carbon markets. Um, and um, that the task force is now wound up because it's completed its first task, which was to set up a governing body known as the um, uh, Integrity Council of the for the Voluntary Carbon Markets, the ICVCM. And I sit as a, a, a board member, um, as part of a 22-person board member, which covers a very, very broad range of, uh, of, of um, um, geographies and and and. Um, uh, and also um, uh, expertise. So we're looking to develop the carbon markets further to to um, support the development of what we call the core carbon principles, which will set a very high threshold quality level for carbon credits around the world. Hopefully that will be something that may be adopted um, in this region and um, and to see the growth of, of carbon markets globally, which we, we believe are very important to, uh, a very important tool to support the uh, decarbonisation goals of the Paris Group. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Jeff, online. Hi, Tracy. Uh, thank you. Uh, good, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Wong. Uh, my involvement with carbon market in China uh, really dates back to uh, my days at the Chicago Climate Exchange. Uh, CCX formed a, a, the first joint venture carbon trading platform and exchange in Tianjin. 2008, and uh, in 2010, CCX was acquired by Intercontinental Exchange. That's how I joined ICE. About four years ago, uh, me and a few other people, or partners, we, uh, we came together in Hong Kong and we formed uh, this new venture called AEX Holding. And our mission is to, our goal is really to transfer international best practices in uh, treating carbon and power to the markets in China. Thank you. Thank you. Grace? Hi, I'm Grace Hung. I am the head of green and sustainable finance at the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited. Um, my role really is to develop uh, green and sustainable finance um, uh, products and services, uh, as well as uh, looking at strategy with, uh, in green finance for Thank you, Grace. Susan? Uh, Susan. Uh, we are also we are also helping with uh, the heavy polluters, and every year we help them with uh, the execution of the uh, contracts. 
So in the past 11 years, we have had a lot of innovations in terms of uh, carbon carbon uh, reduction, carbon emission reduction, as well as um, uh, the green energy. Thank you very much. So thank you. So um, good morning. I'm from ABC China. I work in the policy study as well as a micro macro economy. We also think that ESG is a very important part in our future development, particularly in terms of uh, green financing, green bond issuances, and so forth. We have done great a lot, and this is a very important area that we focus on, including the climate change as well as impact to financing market. So, as well as the trading market, trading uh, carbon trading market. So I hope that uh, we can have a very good exchange today. Thank you. So let's kick start. Let's find out where we are at the carbon market, and let's start from the international market. Can I ask Chris? You start um, sharing. I think I want both international perspective in terms of compliance market and also the uh, voluntary carbon market. So maybe I start with uh, with you, Chris. Yeah, certainly. So, so it, it's um, uh, until very recently we've really focused on these two different markets, and uh, we talk about the the compliance markets, uh, the mandatory markets. These are the markets that have been um, uh, put in place by by governments, by regional um, uh, uh, regional governments as well to control carbon emissions and uh, to, to, to manage that process. Um, Market-based systems, and what we see are the, um, the use of taxes. So countries like um, South Africa, uh, Colombia and elsewhere have introduced taxes. Um, but also um, the, the main tool that, that, that we're seeing, which is a, 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 a kind of flip side of, of a tax is, is a, an emissions trading scheme, uh, cap and trade as, as it's, it's usually known as. Um, and a cap and trade scheme is is where the the emissions are capped. Um, uh, the 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 um, regional authority or the local government says, right, this is going to be the maximum amount of carbon emissions that we're going to allow. And then each year there's a declining um, allowance that's um, that's posted, and it's usually a very clear signal to the market of how much emissions are going to reduce over over time. And uh, eventually, clearly, what you're trying to do is reduce them down to. Um, uh, to, to zero ultimately, um, whereas a tax on the other hand is where you set a price but you don't know what the outcome is going to be. An emissions trading scheme, you know the outcome, you just don't know the price and obviously that has has uh, uh, implications but it tends to, to drive behaviour. It's all about setting that price on carbon, a clear signal for polluters and to ensure that the polluter pays. So that's the mandatory market. You tend to then find that, that specific sectors are covered um, and um, there, there, there are um, uh, uh, areas that are covered by this by this scheme. So the, the most, um, up until recently, the biggest, but certainly still the the, uh, the most liquid in the world is the EU ETS, the EU Emissions Trading Scheme. Um, they have set targets for 2030 of a reduction in emissions by 55% from 1990 levels. So you can see clearly what the what the cap is. Um, and they are reducing emissions effectively at a rate of 4.2% per year. So every year, the the block of allowances that are that are given out um, reduces by by 4.2% uh, a year. Now these allowances are actually auctioned off, so people buy what they need. Um, although some allowances are still given away for free, um, 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 because that helps to support those industries that are in um, competitive areas, things like steel and cement. You still send, tend to see uh, allowance is given away for um, for free because that then creates a, um, a subsidy to those those industries where they're competing against other um, industries that might not have uh, a similar tax or um, or um, emission scheme. So that's that's how the the mandatory market works. And as I say, the European market has been the um, the biggest until recently, and it is the most liquid still. Um, but um, we're going to hear shortly a little bit about the China emissions trading scheme. Um, which uh, which launched in July and is now the biggest in the world, and we expect that to to grow um, grow quickly. Um, then, on the other hand, there are the voluntary markets, and, and, and they're voluntary because you, they're, they're, there is no uh, mandatory reason to to um, uh, participate in the in the voluntary markets, which is why they tend to be um, they tend to be uh, 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 dominated by corporates who are looking to to make some claim around their activities, around their 
environmental um, uh, activities in the market. So whether they might be carbon neutral or net zero, but essentially it's a corporate saying we are looking to reduce our carbon emissions, um, but we, we, we want to be able to, to buy carbon credits um, because we're unable to reduce our emissions immediately. So they're looking for somebody else to effectively reduce or even remove their emissions on, on, on their behalf. And it's actually a global carbon market because there are no borders. Um, we tend to see most of the corporates until recently have been based in, in um, Europe and the Americas, although we are now seeing more and more interest coming from Asia of people who are and companies who want to buy carbon credits to be able to demonstrate that they're actually making a difference somewhere. And a lot of the projects are based in, um, in, in um, developing countries, but also in Asia, in China, in India, um, in Southeast Asia. Uh, a lot of these projects tend to be related to forestry. Um, it's, it's an area where it, the, the, the reductions, um, the, 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 um, the marginal cost of abatement, the, re the cost of reducing carbon dioxide is relatively low. And so um, that's the area that, that, that money has come into. It's also the area where we need most help, where, where effectively um, you need to, to, to drive revenue, to, to, to drive um, funding to prevent the destruction of forestry around the world and, and other natural habitats. So, so it has a double effect of reducing emissions, but also protecting nature. Thank you, thank you, Chris. And Jeff, can we hear about um, the US uh, ETS market? Yeah, uh, in, in the United States, in North America, there are two compliance markets. Uh, one is California, economy-wide cap and trade. Uh, one is in the uh, northeastern part of the United States. It is called Regional Greenhouse Initiative, it's called RGGI. It's a power sector only cap and trade scheme. Um, in, in California, uh, the state government mandated that by 2045, the California e economy will go carbon neutral. And by law, by California law, by 2030, the California needs to achieve a carbon reduction, absolute carbon reduction of 40% versus the baseline of 1999. So, uh, in addition to these two cap and trade schemes, mandatory cap and trade scheme in North America, uh, they are active trading going on today in the so-called REC market. The renewable energy certificate market is a mandatory market. The RECs are issued by states like, like Texas, Pennsylvania, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and so on. So, all together, I mean, there's a reason carbon market is called cap and trade. In order for cap and trade to work, both cap and trade needs to work. In other words, you need to have healthy trading volume, open interest on the trading part in order for the carbon market to send out that long-term price signal by market forces. So in totality, the environmental market in North America today has a open interest of about 1.2 million contracts by July of this year. So if you look at the gold futures and option market during similar time, the same time, July of this year, the gold market trading uh, in North America has an open interest of 1.3 million contracts. So trading is active, in North America, environmental market, people could see that long-term carbon or REC crisis that would that would manage, uh, that would guide their uh, long-term financial planning when it comes to climate change and env environmental markets. Thank you, thank, thank you, Jeff. And let's go and hear about the biggest ETS markets, China. So Susan, can you share with us on the regional ETS market perspective and the newly launched national ETS market perspective from China? Okay, uh, Tracy, as you all know that China has gone through over 10 years of a carbon trading growth from the pilot till now, we have a unified carbon trading mechanism in China. We chose seven areas, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Wuhan, Chongqing, Tianjin, seven cities as pilots for carbon trading. We selected 2,008 companies to be included into the pilot. 
So after about four to five years of a pilot, till 2017, we kicked off the national carbon trading system. So that is after four years of preparation. This year, this national carbon trading mechanism was put in, put in place. The first contract, the first transaction was done in November this year. So as for our achievements, on the 15th of December, all the generators, power generators, over 2,000 generators must complete their own obligations of a carbon, carbon emission reduction as promised before. And it will be very clear that the eight heavy or carbon intensive industries will be included into this scheme. So all the businesses in those industries will be monitored by the government. So now we have the power generators this year. Next there will be cement manufacturers, the steel mills, and so forth will also be included into this national system. Eight carbon intensive industries all together. So this is about achievement this year. At the regional level, we have a carbon trading markets as well. It's not that we have one single national carbon trading system only. We have a regional carbon trading markets as well. For example, in the power generation sector, once those power generators are included into the national system, all the uh, industries are still under the continuous supervision by the government, for example, steel mills and cement manufacturers. Next year or the year after next year, all those businesses will be included into the national system compulsory. And um, currently in Guangzhou, Shanghai, we are launching some new pilot schemes as well as the trading. Thank you, thank you, Susan. And let's hear from Hong Kong, Grace. Can I pass the floor to you? Thank you, Tracy. I must say I've got to thank uh, the Hong Kong Green Finance Association for inviting me, giving this opportunity to uh, have all the experts and share, you know, what we're thinking about the uh, Hong Kong uh, carbon market. So um, uh, in July this year, uh, the cross-agency steering group that was set up by the SFC and HKMA uh, with five members, including Exchange, um, started to look at uh, the opportunities uh, that maybe you know stem from the carbon market. So we created a carbon market work stream and um, and look at the uh, possible opportunities um, in both the Greater Bay Area um, for the compliance market as well as the voluntary carbon market internationally. So um, we are conducting the feasibility study. Uh, looking at potential market demand, the roles and regulations of Hong Kong, um, and uh, potential products, for example, and infrastructure. So, as uh, uh, Eddie said earlier in the earlier panel, you know, we are hoping to share the results of the feasibility study before the end of this year. Um, I think, uh, you know, Hong Kong, you know, being uh, such a great, you know, international finance center, we definitely have a role to play in finding a robust carbon price. Um, and uh, which is very important in terms of, uh, you know, decarbonizing the whole of the economy. So we hope to share more with you in the coming months. Excellent. I'm very much looking forward to hearing more. So for that, let's really debug this and, and, and to find out how, I mean, there's a lot of people still in their mind, okay, how carbon credit can help to accelerate the carbon neutrality goal. And, and I, win, I want to hear some example, current example, application, etc. So maybe, maybe for that, I start with Mr. Wang. Thank you. So carbon trading versus the carbon neutrality, Europe is leading ahead of us in them because the carbon trading has been placed for many years. Most most countries have already said that they're going to realize carbon neutrality by 2050. They have confidence on that. Of course, the biggest market in China, as my colleague said just now, what I think about is that talking about the carbon trading, we have about 10 years of history of a carbon trading in China. And uh, the total volume of a trading is about 400 million to 500 million. And the price is very low, about 5 to 10 yuan per ton. 
So power generation is one of the industries that emits a lot of carbon. And in carbon emission, in power generation sector, for example, if your installment of a capacity is the over the uh, 30 megawatts, um, the million megawatts, usually the carbon emission volume is very high. If it is above a one, uh, is about uh, the one million megawatt, the emission will be even higher. It really depends. It really depends on the equipment. Some is usually the higher generation you. Uh, the uh, newer technology adopt, the less carbon emission you will have. So in my calculation, for the over 1 million uh, megawatt generators, every year by average, they emit about 3.2 million tons. So if we can reduce 26% of our carbon emission and then then uh, that will be a huge number. So looking at the trading price of a carbon, it will be something about the 43 million yuan RMB. But if you look at the trading price in Europe, then it will be over 300 million euro. So the, talking about investment of uh, the new power generation facilities, um, we need about 3.5 billion yuan for a one, min, a 1 million megawatt of a power generation facility. So in 10 years, with the help of a carbon trading, we can recover our investment in 10 years' time. This investment includes the equipment as well as other facilities. Of course, in China, we have a 10 years about a trading uh, carbon trading in China. Of course, uh, this uh, trading system is also evolving. I believe that uh, the uh, pricing, trading price, will also change accordingly. In China, we have about 60% of our power generators that are engaged in carbon re carbon, uh, carbon trading, and uh, the uh, the power generation capability is uh, very high. For example, the installed capacity is over 1 million megawatt, and every year they can save about 600 million tons of uh, carbon emission. So this accounts about 6% of our total emission in China. So this is the one thing. So this definitely helps with the carbon neutrality. In addition to this, the carbon trading system in China is also evolving. I believe that uh, we will. This will encourage uh, more and more new clean energies. So new clean energies will replace some of the uh, coal-fired power generation facilities in the past. So this is about the power generation sector. As you know that we have eight carbon intensive sectors, including building materials, chemicals, cement, steel mills, and so on and so forth. So if you include all of them into the carbon emission reduction scheme, then we can reduce great a lot of our carbon emissions. And I think carbon emission market will play an important role in financial markets. Like in mainland and in the Europe, we're talking about uh, asset pledge and loans uh, secured by carbon sink and um, the carbon trust, etc. There are a lot of these uh, projects in the mainland China. We have in the future carbon futures and carbon options. By doing that, we can reduce uh, the cost of carbon trading. So carbon emission. Um, will become a new source of income for enterprises, and it will increase the cost of carbon emission as well. Uh, that's important to realizing our uh, 30, 60 carbon uh, picking and carbon neutrality goals. Then we hear a lot of uh, different carbon products. So for that, um, Chris, can I come to you for some examples and how to um, uh, using carbon credit to accelerate the neutrality goal? Yeah, sure, Tracy. So, so um, we we put prices on on everything um, that we that we deal with, uh, um, you know, on a day to day basis. We set prices on energy, on metals, uh, agricultural commodities, um, and and and, and um, you know, prices uh, react to supply and demand, and and to and to ensure that these essential commodities are allocated um, efficiently. Um, the problem is that the one important element of of that has been missing um, for for as long as. Uh, 
anybody uh, anybody can remember or anybody knows uh, and that is the price of carbon so so this is this is this is the the, the cost of the pollution that's that's being generated as a, as a result of these activities so so um you know a bit, or more accurately you could say the price has actually been zero so so what carbon markets do and what what whether it's a it's a tax whether it's a it's a um uh, a cap and trade or um or a, a baseline and emissions um uh, system that we see within the voluntary markets that they, they create this 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 pricing mechanism they create this price signal by creating a scarcity for this um, for this commodity, so you could argue that it's being created artificially, but the fact is that we've already got a cap. The cap's set on us by nature. Um, the, 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 the cap's actually around. Uh, I think it's just over 500 billion tons of carbon. Sounds like an awful lot, but of course we're using around 50 billion tons a year, so it will be gone within 10 years. So that's what it does. And then, then once you've got a, a, a price in place and a, and a market, all of the instruments that we would um, see in any other commodity market, uh, the, the derivatives markets, the financially settled derivatives, uh, futures, forwards, um, spot contracts, repos. These are all things that um, mm. that we that we see um, in 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 the in the market. So, for example, if you look at the EU ETS, there's a thriving um, futures market. Um, it's traded on the Intercontinental Exchange, um, which was the the forefront of which was the uh, European Climate Exchange, which Jeff knows well and, and was ob was obviously involved with that with that group when it was formed uh, as part of the um, Chicago Climate Exchange. So, and that and that market is a is a is a vibrant futures market. There are options that are traded on the back of that, um, so people can buy um, carbon for forward delivery um, and um, pay a premium, pay an option premium to be able to fix the price. So it it acts like um, um, other markets, and we're even starting to see a little bit of um uh, retail interest so so uh, clients are coming in who want to be able to invest in the market who want to be able to um, 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 to be able to benefit from rising prices or indeed actually hedge against rising prices if they are um, if they're a big emitter um, we're seeing the development of ETFs um, uh, the the the, the, um, the the retail type funds that are, that are coming to market and that gives people the opportunity to to participate in the market um, to be able to ensure that uh, carbon pricing and the, the cost of carbon is is reflected correctly in decisions that people make um, when they are when they are operating um, uh, in these markets. So we want to see these markets develop further. We want to see them go from being a patchwork of, 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 of little markets around the world, the European market, the markets that, that uh, Jeff's talked about in the US and that we've heard about in China. And ultimately, we want to see one price for carbon globally. Um, we can do that, though, through through the development of the voluntary carbon markets that will create this 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 um, this interconnection between the markets. As I said earlier on, the, the, the voluntary carbon markets are genuinely global already. So by 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 allowing that inter um, interplay between, you know, whether it's um, um, the, the 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 UK or Europe or Singapore or indeed of course Hong Kong and into China, um, that will enable that um, that global price to to develop, and that will will allow the the correct signals to be. Um, uh, to, to, to be sent to a uh, steel producer in China or a cement producer in Turkey so that we get the right mix of, of, of capital going into these markets to, to, to drive that decarbonization globally. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Jeff is coming back online and I must catch you um, on, on this. I want to hear about the pilot trade. Jeff, can you share with us on a recent transaction that you did? Yeah, sorry about that. You know, uh, the it, it really goes back to uh, the time uh, of the September 2020, right? When I got an invitation from Chris and his company, uh, Standard Charters, uh, to join this Mark Carney uh, task force for scaling uh, voluntary market carbon markets. Uh, there are 40 kind of funding members. Uh, and, and I'm one of the member, and then there's a, a, another gentleman from China. Uh, the company that he works with is called Eli. Mm -hmm. So uh, earlier this year, I, uh, AEX, we, we started to talk about CCER project developers, in, including Eli. And the, the, the idea is, can we find uh, buyers in places like Hong Kong, offshore, 
right? People that will step up and say, I will buy high quality CCER in China and we'll use that offsets to offset our carbon footprint uh, in Hong Kong. So, you know, we'll, we'll try to find out which, uh, you know, uh, standards, CCR standards that meet particular international standards. And at the same time, we're talking with them uh, together with Eline about the core carbon principle that, 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 that Chris uh, mentioned from the task force. So to make, to make, kind of make a long story short, uh, July is the impetus when China launched the national ETS allowance online trading in Shanghai. And then in August, we finalized test trades uh, for buyers in Hong Kong. In this case, the both buyers are a member of the Hong Kong Green Finance Alliances, Christine and Ben, and it's Ben's law firm. So they bought forward CCER physically delivered to be issued actually next year, 2022. They bought that uh, offsets credits uh, in, in anticipation of retire, of cancellation or retirement to meet their offsetting goals in Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, report that last month, the organizers of Hong Kong uh, ESG reporting awards event uh, agreed to use the same high quality international standard CCER to offset the carbon footprint for the event. So uh, we're seeing more and more inquiries. We're having more dialogues with companies in Hong Kong that part of their ESG and carbon neutral uh, strategy uh, would in the future involve uh, high quality of uh, CCER uh, credit from China. And the second goal of those test trades, uh, if I may, is really uh, to talk and work with stakeholders in Hong Kong, a world-class financial market center, and to see if we can work with uh, uh, the buyers, the corporate buyer, the banks and brokers in Hong Kong, and really build the global benchmark for high quality uh, CCER in Hong Kong. This is made, this was made very clear by the seller, by Eline, the representative from Eline made it very clear in, in a corporate uh, announcement uh, when we publicized uh, the trade in, uh, in, uh, in, in August that the people like Eline, they want to come forward to Hong Kong and work with the financial player and to see where's the interest and in how all these uh, market participants could work together and build a, a robust benchmark uh, and, and, and hopefully a, a longer term carbon CCER forward price curve uh, for all markets participants in and out China. Thank you. I'm going to steal a question if that's okay with you. Tracy. Please, please. Grace. So we heard a lot, uh, Jeff, about high quality um, and, and you know, Chris was talking about global standards for voluntary carbon markets. Obviously, uh, we need the, the carbon credits to be fungible, right? Um, and that's first and foremost. So um, with, uh, we've got also Susan here who's an expert on CCR as well. So how do you see, I mean, I, I suppose I put this question to, to Chris first and then, and then Jeff, you know, what is this global standard that you're looking for? Are you just talking about core carbon principles that you know your task force was working on? Or are you looking at something else, like you know, a standard for monitoring, reporting, and verification? So um, I, I think that the, the first thing that, that um, we need to do is set the put in place the, the core carbon principles. So the idea behind them is um, that that um, it, 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 we're reviewing all of the standards that already exist in the market. So it's not, it's agno agnostic in terms of the, the, the standards that we're looking at. So uh, as you're probably aware, there's Vera, there's gold standard and, and CCERs are, are a standard in the same way. So are, uh, so is the CDM and ultimately the, the newly minted um, sustainable me uh, development mechanism, the SDM or the 6.4, um, uh, article 6.4, um uh, 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 uh guidelines and 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 rules so 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 there's all of these different standards around there and what we want to be able to do is try and create a high threshold um standard of the standards so it looks at all of these and says well what is it that we really want um a carbon credit to do 
And, and first and foremost, uh, we, 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 we talk about additionality, that the, that the carbon credit itself has to be additional to what would have happened anyway. So it has to be um, creating an incentive for people to do something they wouldn't do normally in the normal course of business. So that's number one. But how do you measure that? You know, what is it? What is the principle behind that? What are we trying to achieve here? So that's one of the first things that we're going to do. Um, and then looking at things like permanence. Um, when, we, when we talk about forestry, what do we mean by permanence or even agriculture? Because it's obviously very easy to, to reverse many of these reductions when you're looking at planting or, or, uh, or indeed uh, avoiding deforestation, you could then suddenly see things, things, things reversed at some point in the future. So how do you deal with those kinds of issues? Leakage, carbon leakage, you may prevent carbon emission reductions in one area, but they then go on somewhere else. And it could be next door, it could be uh, in a different country altogether. So how do you deal with these kinds of, um, these kinds of issues? So th those are the main ones that we're, that we're looking at, um, but there are others. And it's also then, how do you, how do you really um, focus on that? Because if you look at any of these standards, they all have the same principles behind them, but they apply them differently. And as you say, it comes back to, 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 to um, uh, measuring and, and, and um, um, being able to, 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 uh, to, to, to view exactly what's going on within those projects. Yeah. How do you know how many trees have actually been either planted or, or, or not chopped down that would have been chopped down anyway? How do you know how much um, uh, 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 renewable energy has been, been generated compared to, um, or, or, or how, many, how much fossil fuel has been pushed out by the generation of, of renewable energy? So it's measuring all of those things. So I think, I think that will be, um, it will be very positive and helpful if we can have global standards for that as well. I think that is something that will develop um, as part of that. We know that, again, within the Article 6, um, and I, I, this probably may be the first time we've been mentioning Article 6 within this conversation, but Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, um, which was agreed in Glasgow at COP26 uh, uh, earlier this month, um, has put in place these global um, framework for, for, for international carbon trading. And they've also talked about things like standardized baselines and the baseline being the the baseline at which you measure these emissions reductions against so having the standardization globally um, and, and something that's recognized by different countries and different um, jurisdictions that will be very very important in terms of establishing the credibility of these markets and ensuring that we're all on a level playing field thank you and and jeff the questions from brace also to you do you have something to add on this space yeah, I mean, the, the fungibility is key, right? Uh, but uh, it, the market's so young, Grace. Uh, the idea is you got to let the uh, market participants uh, try. It, it's a try and error, right? One and how we reach fungibility, nobody knows, in my opinion. You got to let people try. We got a bunch of buyers in Hong Kong that buy into this core company principle or buy into the standards of Corsia. And then you got a bunch of sellers in China, right? Uh, you come, you build the curve, you mine the data, and then you use international best practices. Maybe in this little niche, right? You start to have some kind of a, a, a benchmark emerging. And then you talk with other uh, 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 Corsia eligible uh, credits from other countries. And then maybe you can, the two markets will eventually, the two market maybe will merge or will not merge, but liquidity will merge somehow, right? So the idea uh, is to like market forces play out. It, it is, it would be, a, in my opinion, a mistake for any government to mandate, oh, you gotta trade CER, you gotta trade Corsia on this platform, you, got, you gotta be an incumbency, you gotta have a, a gazillion dollars in your bank account to start trading. Let market works, right? And the, the, this is not, by the way, Grace, this is not the first time uh, people try in an era uh, and eventually reach some kind of a, a, a fungibility. Uh, if you talk about uh, steel markets, it has all kinds of a basis uh, risks. Uh, if you look at the uh, crude oil markets, right, the benchmark is, is ice Brent and, 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 and the WTI, but when everyday transaction in crude oil, Physical transaction, they have all kinds of different standards, API, intensity, but financial market by trial and error over the last 20 years eventually reached a, 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 a consensus regarding the seaborne 
approval of contracts or, or the WTI for North America, they would come and play. And, and then I, I would anticipate the same thing will happen in uh, offsets, in CCR or in VCS. Uh, you know, the initial, if you look at the initial stamp, uh, attempts at harmonizing or trading, building liquidity in other jurisdiction for, for international standard offsets, uh, we're starting to see some tractions, some liquidity. Uh, so hopefully the same thing happened in high quality offshore CCR trading uh, too. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. I want to highlight, um, since Jeff has mentioned, and also uh, Chris, on the ICVCM, I, I Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Market, which previously known as TSVCM. So with this platform, um, they have launched an independent um, governance body with, two, tw with 22 independent uh, um, 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 advisors in this board, which our chairman, Dr. Ma Jun, is part of, which bring enormous amount of knowledge uh, from uh, from China into this uh, platform as well. Just want to highlight that. So with that, let's switch gear into Hong Kong. Okay, so we heard a lot this morning from the financial secretary to uh, chief executive from, uh, um, from the MA and also uh, from Dr. Ma and here on this panel a lot. So let's dive deeper into Hong Kong's role. How, how Hong Kong can play and facilitate developing on you know, the carbon market, we can share like on from the compliance market's perspective, the unified GBA uh, carbon market and the voluntary carbon market perspective. So for that, I want everyone to chip in and I will start with Grace. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I think Dr. Ma said earlier uh, in the previous panel as to the Hong Kong roles can play. Um, and, and indeed, you know, his, his uh, Carbon Connect idea that he brought to us, you know, a year ago. Um, I think, you know, Hong Kong being, you know, international finance center, we're very good at risk management. We have a very well-functioned uh, exchange. Uh, we have the expertise in, uh, in, 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 in trading, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, products, including commodities. So I think, you know, we, we want to make sure that, uh, we don't miss the chance for this you know, new uh, asset class. Um, and I think there will be a lot more um, efforts to, um, to groom the talent to, to really um, uh, understand this market. So um, the other thing is that, um, you know, we can, as you know, Dr. Ma mentioned, play a role in bringing our companies, um, investors, you know, into the China, uh, China's uh, ETS. Uh, because Hong Kong is, you know, too small to have its own ETS. And, uh, you know, on the international side, I think we'll be very much focused on the voluntary carbon market. I think Hong Kong is the right marketplace for that. Um, given our close relationship to China, there are lots of nature-based solutions in China, um, as well as carbon technology. Um, I think uh, there are also international investors looking for carbon credits specifically in China. So I think we can play that role, given that we are super connector between China and the rest of the world. Um, I, I do see that. Thank you, thank you. Since we're talking about the ETS market and connectivities in China, Susan, can I ask you to share from your perspective? Okay, I think three. there are three parts. The first part is that you have to look back to the um, implementation of our contracts in the first year. So this is the first year. As you can see, so many power generators begin to implement the contracts. They are anxious because in the trading car, uh, carbon market, you can use 5% of CCR. So the total emission is about the 4 billion. Um, but uh, actually, in the in the real market, only a small number of power generators can use the low cost of a CCR to implement the uh, execute the uh, con the uh, contracts. Otherwise, they have to buy a lot of a quota uh, at a very higher cost. That's why all the major power generators began to plan for their own carbon emission strategy to looking for began looking for new technologies and next year as i said some cement and other industries will also be included for example conch cement several months ago they already felt that shanghai stock exchange uh, 
announced the the policy, and the Kong Cement began to work out its own plans, trying to look new technologies and face out old technologies. So apparently, this is the result of the strong policies from the governments and the regulators. And now, looking at Hong Kong, I think the first thing is that we can bring along the new technologies to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, we have a lot of international talents, a lot of good universities. I've been in Hong Kong for a week, and I noticed that there are so many good companies which have very good technologies. It's only that in Hong Kong, the market size is not big enough, big enough, but they have the technology, they have the talents. I think that we can connect mainland China and Hong Kong together, and we can also bring their new talents, the new technologies back to mainland China. And secondly, we have this 3060 strategy. We need a great a lot of talents. As you know that in mainland China, China, we are educating and training talents in universities and other organizations. In Hong Kong is also a very good place for cultivating talents. Hong Kong is an international finance center. And the carbon emission, carbon trading by itself, carbon trading is featured for finance and internationalization. And Hong Kong is the right place for us to train our international talents. We have a very good international exposure. You have a very good facilities to educate such talents. So in the future, when we go further internationalized, I think that Hong Kong will be definitely a very good place for us to choose. So Grace and Dr. Ma, both of them mentioned that Hong Kong is a financial center. It is a part of China. It is a bridge to China for China to go global. Definitely, it will be good for us to set up our own international assets pool here in Hong Kong. The talents, uh, the assets from mainland China and from international uh, markets. So, uh, China is currently a spot market now, but Hong Kong is the biggest carbon trading market. I believe that we must need different tools. We need futures. We need derivatives, and um, in this way. We can we can get a say in the carbon pricing, and definitely Hong Kong has a very big role to play. So we need we, I think that we need to explore and innovate. For example, from a GBA point of view, we can start our exploration together. So this is my personal view. Thank you. Uh, I have good news for you. Um, so uh, in uh, Hong Kong, we uh, HKEX we um, invested uh, seven percent uh, of a Guangzhou Futures Exchange in February, and in August uh, we have signed an MOU with the Guangzhou Futures Exchange, uh, looking at more collaboration and uh, education, um, as well as um, product development. So um, hope that there will be uh, futures of carbon very soon. That's great. <laughs> That's music to my ears. Can I ask uh, Mr. Wang to share as well? I do agree what uh, Madam Wang said about uh, the financial institute, financial position of Hong Kong. The growing the carbon market in China definitely is a very important part of a green finance in in Hong Kong. Last May, several several government ministries issued a policy regarding building the Great Bay Area into a green finance center to support the growth of Hong Kong. And now in Hong Kong, in terms of the carbon market, Hong Kong does not have a great a lot of activities. Financial institutions in Hong Kong are working on three areas. Number one, the uh, greenization of uh, the institutions itself, that is, the providing green loans or green deposits. And also in the bond market, help with the issuance of green bonds. And second is that the financial institutions incorporated the um, uh, climate change related risk into its uh, risk management plan. So uh, we know that uh, there are different uh, risks, operations and, uh, and the uh, markets and so forth. And the climate, re climate change related risks are now included in the risk management plans for all the financial institutions. So specifically in the carbon trading market in China, in Hong Kong, 
this system must be built, and we can learn from the best practices from mainland China, and we can also attract those the uh, green related companies to trade in Hong Kong, including traders from other countries as well in Asia. So that in, in this way, Hong Kong can really turn itself into a carbon trading center as well. And something like the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Hong Kong will be a center for carbon trading activities as well. Second one is about financial support. Hong Kong is featured for its financial services. So in addition to registration and trading, there are a lot of financial services involved. For example, the mortgage for carbon assets, the, uh, uh, as well as uh, the um, mortgage loans and so forth. So all of those the financial services will also be needed re regarding the carbon trading activities. These are the things that Hong Kong can do. So now the Hong Kong banks have already learned about the one billion um, yuan RMB for green finances, but about 45% of them goes to the uh, mainland Chinese uh, companies. So in addition to this, we have the futures, we have the options, we have other derivatives. So if Hong Kong can offer all those products and services, I believe that uh, Hong Kong will definitely be able to play an even more important role in this. And uh, in this way, Hong Kong will also have a great say in the pricing of carbon in China. And thirdly, we can have a, a new Connect program, such as the uh, Hong Kong Shanghai Connect program or Shenzhen Hong Kong Connect program. We can have a Carbon Connect program as well. In this way, the capitals from other countries can also buy and sell uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, for example, in the carbon stock, uh, carbon exchange in Hong Kong, I think uh, this will be a new idea, a new business for Hong Kong to explore. So we can also provide a third party consultancy services in, in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong has a very good consultancy professionals. Is, for example, the reporting, the reviewing, the examinations, and so forth. We do have a lot of professionals who can help with those consultancy, consultancy uh, jobs. In this way, Hong Kong can really grow the carbon market here very well. And uh, in, in this way, Hong Kong can also contribute its share in carbon neutrality in the country. Um, so, Chris, can I ask you to um, share about your view, Hong Kong carbon market, may that be compliance or voluntary? Well, I think it can be both to a certain extent, um, but I think certainly the voluntary market is, is the um, uh, probably where, where there's going to be the most opportunity, at least initially, um, because of that, that the, the access that, um, uh, that Hong Kong has to, to China itself and you know, developing, helping to, to source and develop those uh, international projects that, that, that um, you know, maybe may be uh, eligible directly in China through CCERs, so being able to invest actually into China directly or bringing credits in that might be uh, eligible for uh, for compliance in China, so so um, obviously that second part is, at the moment is is um, uh, is not a route, but maybe that's something that could change over time. But I mean, what we we have to remember um, that that uh, 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 the, the, the 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 Belt and Road Initiative represents something like forty percent of the Earth's total uh, land area and fifty five percent of total uh, total CO two emissions. So so there is a, a huge opportunity here, and and Hong Kong is is naturally placed to help host the voluntary carbon markets um, as, it, as it, is, it sits alongside an international finance hub and, and an offshore yuan center. So, you know, again, these sorts of um, um, this infrastructure that's already in place will support the growth of, of, of the, the carbon markets in whichever way that, um, that Hong Kong wants to support it. But as I say, the, you know, when you look at the size of the, of, of Hong, the Hong Kong market itself, um, that's relatively small. Obviously, the Greater Bay Area, then you're talking about a much, much larger um, a number of emissions, and uh, you know, again, these are areas where there is uh, uh, Hong Kong is in, has an element of control, is able to 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 be able to uh, make decisions over its own destiny. So, you know, I think that the the voluntary carbon markets can be the the entry point, can be the area that, that Hong Kong can really 
um, focus on at least initially. Um, where it goes from there, obviously, one has to um, you know to 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 understand the um, uh, what's going on in the ground and the politics within China. Um, and obviously, I'm not really close enough to that. I'm sure the panel has a much better um, view on that than I do. But I think that you know the voluntary markets and the again that um, ability for Hong Kong to be able to to give access to, to China itself, but also to be able to give China access to the international market. So that's that two-way um, uh, two um, uh, capacity that, uh, that Hong Kong has, has traditionally had and will have in the future. Thank you, Chris. And Jeff, any last word? Yeah, I, I probably <clears throat> have a slightly different angle uh, than uh, Chris. So uh, every time I talk with Chinese card markets experts, uh, one issue that often comes up is the lack of sufficient trading volume. And the experts inevitably told me, uh, Jeff, we need the solution is carbon futures, right? As if futures alone were the be all end all for pricing carbon. Uh, today, China already has 90 futures product listed on futures exchanges. And as Grace told us a, a few minutes ago, the government plans to list carbon futures in the coming years. But to list carbon futures, I think we need, we might have to use a slightly different playbook or a different route. And I think that's where banks, brokers, trading houses in Hong Kong could come in and make the biggest impact. As a first step, these financial players from Hong Kong needs to step up and come over to places like Guangdong and sit down with the power companies and understand their most clear and present trading challenges. For example, these power companies would tell you earlier this month, in the second day of November, the wholesale power market prices in Guangdong moved from a low of 70 cents RMB per kilowatt hour to a high of 1.1 uh, RMB. That is a 69% price swing within a span of 24 hours. Mm. Uh, so that's the challenge, right? Here, the power companies in Guangdong got two needs. One is building internal risk and data capacity so they can improve their short-term electricity trading uh, situation. And the second need is to have qualified financial counterparties that would transfer their medium to long-term price risk in the over-the-counter marketplace, the so-called Zhongchangqi market, mm. right? So as the Hong Kong firms become engaged on the power trading side first, uh, in Guangdong, for example, right, they can simultaneously take a closer look at the carbon portfolio of these power companies, uh, as TCERs or, or allowances, etc. And the goal, the goal here is again with regulating trading, the compliance companies and the financial players from Hong Kong could start to build, start to build a a, a forward carbon price curve that goes out two, three, four years or longer. China is it, it's the second largest economy already, finally, right? Second largest economy in the world with 70% of the global GDP and, and, and a large commodity trading uh, country. Uh, but if you look at open interest, which is a key measurement of institution participating participation in futures trading, China still that's a very long way to go. Uh, globally, the total open interest for futures is 1.1 billion contracts. In China, that number is 30 million, less than two, less than three percent of the global open. And I think that's a, a, a real pain point for practitioners to price carbon efficiently. And, and frankly, that's where firms from Hong Kong and beyond. Uh, could come in and adopt international best practices in trading Chinese carbon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I am going to wake the floor up by asking anyone would like to raise any questions because this is the time. It's very hard to 
put these uh, expert, carbon expert panels <laughs> together. So anyone on the floor would like to ask questions? Oh, I see a very eager hand too. So um, I'll go to Ben. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for a, a great uh, um, uh, presentation. Um, my question is this. We're talking about Hong Kong's role in supporting the um, I mean, global carbon markets, but also, in particular, the development of China's uh, carbon market. Okay, we talked about Hong Kong being a natural place, or sort of an international trading hub for China carbon. So my question is this. What's stopping Hong Kong right now being that international market for China carbon? You saying that we are slower than Singapore? <laughs> um, you know what we do here. You know <clears throat> we are conservative, and we have to really look at the you know the regulations and legislation. And and Dr. Ma talked about you know um, voluntary carbon market. It's not regulated. You know should we have a regulated market here? I mean this is something that is part of the feasibility study that uh, SFC and HKEX are conducting. So. Um, Yes, we are maybe a bit slower, but when we do come out with a, a, a carbon market, um, that's going to be fully functioned and very liquid. And bigger. <laughs> very transparent. <laughs> I, that's my dream anyway. So we are, we are definitely looking at that and we will share more next month. Ben just did my web up. I'm going to take one more from Florence. <laughs> um. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for uh, Tracy and the panel members for sharing this, your uh, exciting vision. I just want to uh, raise a particular point that has not been covered in the panel is uh, taxation. Now, no, uh, on one hand, we are all um, um, have this aspiration for carbon neutrality. However, based on my understanding, within, say, the mainland China, within the United States, there is no, not a conformed or confirmed taxation rules on the nature of uh, carbon trading. Is it a commodity? Is it um, an intellectual property? Is it a financial uh, instrument? Because different nature, the classification, would have different taxation treatments. And at the end of the day, it not only adds to the compliance uh, concern, <laughs> I wouldn't say burden, but also the financial yield at the end uh, uh, for the um, investors as far and as well as the carbon, uh, as, I mean the cash flow. So as if uh, Hong Kong is going to play a role as a um, carbon trading derivative hub or financial instrument hub. Now, of course, Hong Kong at the moment, not only we do not levy taxation uh, uh, on profits of uh, this, if it is done through uh, investment fund, because back in 2006, Hong Kong government has already inserted uh, carbon trading derivative as a uh, qualified asset for fund um, exemption. However, for many other countries, uh, so uh, if the taxation issues are not clarified or uh, certain, that would add complexity to a smooth uh, launch of a carbon trading system. So this is my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Very good questions. And I'm going to do a plug for this afternoon's report preview because we will definitely talk about tax on green infrastructure. So do stay tuned with us this afternoon. Um, on that question, do I have any tickets on, on, on the floor or online? Carbon tax. You're talking about carbon tax. You're talking about whether the carbon asset class like carbon credit, how are we going to trade that carbon credit and therefore the tax resulting from holding a carbon credit? Yeah. Um, in Hong Kong, we do not have carbon tax Correct. yet. Okay. Correct. How, how, however, uh, what I'm talking about is the trading of the uh, carbon trading. Uh, based on my understanding uh, with my um, China colleagues, that a different uh, exchange in the China cities where the carbon trading, uh, carbon exchange operates, um, the local tax authorities actually have different treatment for the taxation because it's not only about the taxation on the profits, but also there may be a value added tax. So there are different kind of taxation, different kind of name that could take away the profit or the part of the cash from the trading system. And that would co also cause, uh, I would say compliance, additional compliance requirement for the custodian bank, for the clearing house, et cetera. So I'm just raising this. So if we are going, going to um, create a cross-border or international carbon trading system, I think this, is, this needs to be addressed. 
I think we just found the next projects for HKGFA to dive into a lot more uh, to go and look at this particular issue. I think it's um, definitely a, a project that we should launch at the working group. But, but I mean, what I can add is that uh, there has been discussions around, you know, looking at the carbon credit and whether, you know, it is, you know, an intangible commodity. And if so, you know, uh, it would affect, you know, the uh, T1 capital that um, the institution can hold, right? Um, so I, IFRS is supposed to be looking at that, um, and uh, we do not have any updates other than we know that they're looking at this issue, because you know that if if if, the, if a corporate cannot hold it uh, or hold a lot of this uh, because it would hurt their T1 capital, I think uh, something needs to be done. Thank you. I think that is call it a conclude of our panels. So what I hear the consensus from this uh, panel is. A high integrity, well-functioned carbon market is essential for us to reach the carbon neutrality goal. And Hong Kong is strategically placed and positioned to facilitate, and there's a strong desire and need um, to have a regional carbon center set up with the view to help to open the China market. So with that, I can I ask you to join me to thank our experts panel for this insightful sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.